Well, good morning again. I don't have a mask on now. I've got the mic closer. I hope those in the parking lot can hear me. If you can't beep the horn, they, they can hear. Okay, I couldn't hear their horn, but Brian heard them. We want to continue to welcome people. It's good to see Trish, Brian Rice here. Candy is out of town. She's up in Tallahassee, I believe. Johnette, Patty, Autumn, Kevin, um, you have to behave yourself because she's, she's watching, even though she can't see you now. Alan, Bob, Sherry, Josh, I hope it's Josh with Josh and Mike. Tell Mike we said hi. Jamie, Linda, Winifred, we're just good to have all of y'all here. Before I get started, I want to lift up a few other people. We have people in the hospital right now that can't have any family members with them. We have people in nursing homes who um, are struggling. There's a lot of nursing homes out there that are really having a battle to deal with uh, this COVID and this virus. So we pray, hey, Kevin, could you close that door for me? But we're going to start today in the book again, the book of Mark. And this is a series called Hashtag Jesus. And I don't do Facebook, as some of y'all know, but I do do Twitter, which is kind of an odd thing, but... But they have a thing on Twitter called hashtag. It's basically the pound sign or the number sign. And if you put out a message that involves the Miami Dolphins and you put hashtag Miami Dolphins, people can search for anybody who's talking about the Miami Dolphins. So this hashtag Jesus series is a way for us to say we want to gather all those who love and believe and follow Jesus. And we want to show them the way. We want to go through a gospel which tells a story of Jesus. Obviously, the the the... The Gospel of Mark is um, somewhat unique, and it's not chronological order, but it, it shows in great detail the life of Jesus. And what's kind of neat about the book of Mark is so many of the Gospels show the words of Jesus, which are huge, and they show his sermons and things he said. Mark, a lot of times, shows what he did. There are times, of course, where he includes what Jesus said, but obviously we know Jesus was a man of action, if I were to say, well, that guy is all talk, it's easy to talk the talk, but not so easy to walk the walk. Well, I can promise you Jesus and his followers walk the walk. So I want to see what we can learn today to maybe look at our own lives and to certainly ask God to show us, are we walking the walk or are we just perhaps giving lip service to God and maybe to others? And we're saying, I'll pray for you, or take care, or come see me at church. But we really don't walk the walk with them. I made a rookie mistake. I make it often. I've included almost the entire chapter. So I'm going to get right into scripture. And the first thing I want us to think about, and I'm going to explain what this means in a minute. But if, if, if we're believers in Christ, if we follow him, if we live for him, if he's truly changed our life, we need to make sure things we say and things we do don't give the good Lord a bad name. And that's a phrase I came up with about 15 or so years ago at Publix. And I'm sure it's been around forever. But I had some situations where I would kind of throw out every now and then, hey, man, we can't give the good Lord a bad name. So we're going to see some people in this story that sadly did that. I'm going to go right to verse 1 in chapter 3. It says, another time, and that's how Mark tells his whole story of Jesus. This happened, that happened, this happened. It's not in chronological order. But he says, another time Jesus went into the synagogue. So a house of God, a place of worship, hopefully full of, hopefully full of a lot of believers. And it says, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the, with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. So he wanted to make it clear what he was going to do, he wanted to see their response. He wanted all, everybody to see this man. He wanted them to understand the before and the after and see what their thoughts were. But before he did anything, he said, he asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? And like we often do when we're caught wrong or when we, don't, when we know the answer is not what we want, it says, they remained silent. How did Jesus respond? Verse 5, he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. 
Well, we've heard in the first two chapters of Mark that there were things done on the Sabbath that the Pharisees had problems with. They loved all the rules. They loved all the regulations. They added to the rules and regulations for things they were good at where they could look outwardly very pleasing to God, but inwardly they were not pleasing to God. And of course, obviously Jesus knew that, said he was deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he used a, something they did back in the Middle East, and even nowadays we still do this. He went to extremes. He was healing a man's hand, but the question he asked them was, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or kill? I mean, he's adding to this man's life. They think it was his arm that was lame, not just a hand that wouldn't work. There's all kind of theories that he did work that required use of both hands, so on and so forth. He was changing this man's life. Yet they couldn't find anything good in that because they weren't looking for good. They were looking for bad. They wanted their rules. They wanted it their way. And they wanted to keep those in power away from having any influence, from having any power. Everywhere, everywhere Jesus went, and we're going to see that, there was a crowd, there was a crowd, there was a crowd. Some were there for good reasons. Some were there for not so good reasons. But his message and what he was doing was being put out there. And the people in charge, like the Pharisees and the Herodians, they were actually enemies of the Pharisees. They had nothing in common. They disagreed on almost everything. Yet, just like we hear the saying that sometimes politics make strange bedfellows, well, sometimes when you're doing evil, you can get all kind of people to come alongside you and say, let's do this. Sometimes it's lonely when you're doing the right thing. And just like Pastor Eric said, sometimes even in our own mind, we know we're serving God, but we beat ourselves up. We beat ourselves down. We say we didn't do it good. We can't do it good. We don't want to do it. And this whole giving the good Lord a bad name, almost every retail place that I'm aware of in America, if they're open on Sunday, they don't have the right to force an employee to work on Sunday. There's about six or eight types of categories that are protected, and you as a manager or as somebody who schedules don't want to go down that road. If somebody's willing to work on Sunday, you schedule them and you use them. But if they say, I have a right to practice my religious beliefs, you can't infringe upon that. And there's all kind of protected categories, race and gender and so on and so forth. Well, I used to have to schedule people on Sundays at Publix. I worked almost every Sunday. I had a great church, a great pastor that was, had a Saturday night service. So I could still go on Saturday night and feel like I was serving God and worshiping God and praising God. And I worked every Saturday, Sunday because... Most of the times, all the big shots didn't work every Saturday, Sunday. So I knew I, I wouldn't see the health department on Saturday or Sunday. I wouldn't see all these vice presidents because they had the good life of the weekend off. And then I knew Monday through Friday, I got two days off. So I got like a 40% chance of never seeing these people. So I had a, some ulterior motives. But I, I, I obviously worked every Sunday too because I wanted to set the example when I could. And I had some people who said, hey, can't work Sundays. I knew what their lifestyle was. I didn't judge them, but I said, good for you. And I would hear every Monday about what they did, fishing, boating, golfing, sleeping till noon, all those things. And I'm like, good for you. I also had people who wanted Sundays off, and I knew they were a part of some kind of religious practice, some kind of church, some kind of worshiping God. But every now and then, you needed people who weren't allowed to work Sundays who would ask for them off to work. I always went to the believers, the ones that I knew really wanted it and said, hey, so and so's on vacation, so and so had to go out of town because of this or that. Could you possibly work this Sunday? Most of the time, they would do it. But every now and then, they would throw up their rights and the rules, just like the Pharisees here. I don't have to work Sunday. You can't force me to work Sunday. And of course, I would drop it. I'm not going down that road. But I used to joke around with them. And these were believers, just like in this church here. There were some believers who were finding fault with Jesus. And I used to joke with them and say, eh, I understand. You know, I have to be at church. I want to be at church. I'm not going to start because if I start, you'll work me every. And, you know, I'd shown them time and time again that I wouldn't do that. But I would joke with them and say, well, we got to remember, we can't give the good Lord a bad name. You know, he needs a favor. He needs somebody to help him right now. He needs this day off. We, we can't do it with two people here. We need five or six. But if we're not careful, we get wrapped up in our own rights. We get wrapped up in rules that maybe aren't true or aren't practical or aren't applicable. And that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. I'm going to continue on in verse 7. It says, 
It says that Jesus withdrew his disciples with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him. So once again, a crowd gathering around. He goes on in verse 9 to say, Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirit saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. Well, my entire life, and we studied it in seminary, but I, I still, um, that's not how my brain thinks sometimes. My entire life, I struggle at times when I think of spiritual warfare and demons and impure spirits. I certainly know there's a good and there's a bad, and I know we all have freedom to do what we want to do, and we all have fleshly lives and so on and so forth. But I think we all can agree there's definitely good and evil in this world. There's good and evil in us. There are selfish desires that want to be in charge. And there are, there are pure godly types of desires that we want to do that sometimes we struggle with. And I think of the, uh, I, I think, I think of the parable with the Cherokee Indians. There was a Cherokee uh, man who was a grandfather talking to his grandson about life. And he said, there are two wolves that live in me. One is a black wolf and one is a white wolf. And he said, the black wolf is evil. It's full of slander and anger and sorrow and hatred and sadness. Everything that's bad, that wolf is running through me. He said, there's also a white wolf. That white wolf is full of goodness and love and peace and joy and understanding and compassion. And they battle each other all day, every day. I've had it all my life. I'm going to have it all my life. And the grandson was amazed with the story and he because that's how kids think, you know, they're used to video games and everything else. And he said, Grandpa, who wins? Which one is winning? Who wins? And we've heard this phrase before. The grandfather said, whichever one you feed, whichever one you feed gets stronger and wins. So if you listen to the wrong things, if you watch the wrong TV shows, listen to the wrong music, engage in conversations with the wrong people who don't benefit you at all, you can get that anger worked up. And that rage and that envy and that sorrow and that depression and so on and so forth. But if you try to feed that good wolf, the one who can overpower the evil and say, you know what? I know what God wants for me. I know what God's doing here. I'm going to look at his fruits. I'm going to look at the fruits of what Jesus was doing. And we know that even the impure spirits knew who Jesus was. was. They said, you are the son of God. And his response to them was, don't tell others about me. And that was for one reason only. He knew they were known as liars. He knew that people didn't believe them. That they, they turned things around for their own good, for their own evil purposes, not to praise God and to bring, not to bring any kind of glory to God. So he's like, I don't need you to tell people how good I am. I'm going to show them how good. My father's going to work through me. He wanted his actions to show who he was. So we need to remember to not, to, to not give the good Lord a bad name. We need to make sure that we understand who he is. And we need to remember that he is God and I am not. My own thoughts about what Jesus is doing a lot of times doesn't matter. If I don't understand why he's restored somebody's life or why he hasn't restored somebody's life. I can say I know what his plan is, what his purpose is. It's to bring glory to him and to heal this country and to heal this land in whatever way he seems fitting to restore their life or not to restore their life. We know eternally their life's going to be restored. If they've come to Christ, if they've walked the walk and not just talked the talk, they're going to have an eternity in heaven. So if you don't want to give the good Lord a bad name, what do you got to do? You got to make sure that your behavior and your beliefs are the same. That's brutally hard, but if you're feeding the right wolf... It can be quite easy. If you surround yourself with the right things and the right people, it can be much easier. So in chapter 13, once, once again, we said Mark doesn't go in order. It's talked about in chapter 1 and 2 about some things that he did with, that he did with the disciples. But in chapter 13, he talks about when he first called the disciples. And it says that Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. I'm going to stop there. Those six words, those six words, he called to them those he wanted. I can promise you he's calling every one of us every day of our lives. 
He's calling us in an an eternal way, saying, I want you to receive the gift of of my son on the cross. That's what God's calling us. And Jesus is calling you saying, I've paid for it all. I've done it all. Your sins don't matter. That evil side that you struggle with doesn't matter if you accept me. We can fix that. We can work on that eternally. We can work on that while we're here on earth. And what did they do? As soon as it says, he called to him, to them, to him, those he wanted, and they came to him. Those four words, they came to him. They didn't say, I'll get back with you. They didn't say, let me think about it. They didn't say, I've got some things to take care of. It wasn't four or five of them that said, I'm ready. The other one said, I don't know about this. You need to talk me into it. I just don't know if this is true or real. I don't know if I want to commit this way. They came to him. They immediately walked the walk. And each disciple, except for one, of course, that we're going to talk about here in a minute, each disciple continued to walk with him. They weren't perfect. They certainly still continued to sin. If you know anything about Peter, if you know things about Thomas not believing at certain times because he wasn't sure of what was going on, but they continued to walk with him throughout their life, and almost every single one of them had a horrible death here on earth, but had a glorious, glorious life in heaven with Jesus. Verse 14 says, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed. And I'm not going to read those names, but to have the ability to drive out demons, have the authority to drive out demons. I can tell you, if you're watching today, if you're here, if you're in the parking lot, you have that same authority to drive out demons. When somebody wants to talk about somebody that, and not in a positive way, perhaps it's gossip or attacking them, you have the right to say, you know what, I don't know if I even agree with that. Or you know what, I don't want to hear with that. Or you know what, I know God loves them as much as everybody. Or you know what, I, I, I've got things in my life that aren't perfect, so I don't want to go jump on their life. You're driving out that evil thoughts, those, those, that anger, that rage, that judgment. You're driving that out and you're trying to replace it with the love that God has for you in this person's life. If you watch any news in the last six weeks or six months or however long it's been now, over and over there's some video of some person losing it. On one side or the other of a mask issue or I don't have to do this or I have a right to do that. And there's always somebody filming it. And some person, we always look at their behavior going, wow, that guy's a nut job. Or that woman, what is she thinking? What is she doing? They get physical at times, certainly verbally abusive, and it's just crazy. And quite often the internet goes crazy and they find out who they are and they hunt them down and they call them and do the same thing that person did to them. Now I'm going to threaten you and I'm going to say all these things about you. And they help them get fired and they do all these horrible things. And then quite often that person comes back and says, that's not who I am. I feel bad that I reacted that way. I feel bad that I said that. Well, that's simply their behavior. And if their beliefs, what they're telling us is true, not matching up. And we go through that daily. There are things we say and do that we're like, man, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't thought that. And that's why we need to understand daily that Jesus is calling us. That he's saying, I want you to serve my purpose. I want you to drive out those demonic things in your own heart and in others' You have the ability to have the influence on them. You have the ability to show them God's love. We're called to do all kind of stuff, all, all kind of things, all kind of stuff. And the most important thing we're called to do is to love each other, to have love for ourselves, to not let that voice in us beat us down, to not let the voice of others who may mean no harm, but say something and we take it. And like Pastor Eric says, we produced this big video and this big purpose of why they said what they said, and they meant nothing by it. But we can be our own worst enemy. We can feed that that dark wolf, that black wolf, over and over again to where he's completely in control of our life. And it was John who said over and over, and he wrote more and more about the love of Jesus. And that's why facing him, that's why being drawn to him when he calls you, moving closer and closer to him is going to help you give him a good name in all that you say and do. It's going to help your behavior and your beliefs match up. I pray often in these last two or three months when I go out in public, I pray that 
I'll behave the right way. And so far, so good. I haven't had anybody attack me for wearing a mask. I haven't had anybody attack me when they tell me their feelings. And I say, yeah, it's crazy, man. I normally, all I normally say is we're kind of taking it seriously. And I leave it at that. I don't preach to them. I don't tell them, what are you crazy? You went here. It's none of my business. I don't care. I, I, I don't. And I've, I've told my wife, you know, we can't worry about anybody but us. And certainly our loved ones and our families. Um, we all want the truth. I know the truth is God wants me to get through this. And if I don't get through this, God's got a plan for me. So I can't lose. I'm a believer who can't lose. So being called to him is big. We don't want to squander the opportunity. We have the ability to get to as close to him as we can. And that's what we obviously need to be doing. So to carry on, it says in verse 20, Then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. So here he was in the beginning in this synagogue with a group of believers, and they're finding fault in him. People who say they love God and praise God and want God to perform good works, but not through this man. We don't want him to get the glory. And who is he to say he's in charge? Who is he to say he's the son of God? We know the impure spirits were saying he was the son of God for their, own, their, for their own reason. And now here again, his own family. So he's getting it from every side he can. His own family says he's out of his mind. Verse 23, so Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parable. This is a great parable. It's pretty simple. But we make it pretty confusing at times. But he says, how can Satan drive out Satan? So he's addressing, you think I'm a spirit? You think I'm the devil? You think I'm Satan? You think I'm here to perform dark things? You think I'm here to bring, bring glory to impure things? He says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And he, once again, trying to let them know he's not evil. He's not an impure spirit. He says, and if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. And he says, in fact, no one can enter a strong man's house. And that strong man is Satan. And he says, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. And that's what Jesus has done. He's in charge of this earth. Although there are evil forces out there, although there's spiritual, warf there's spiritual warfare going on, Jesus is in charge. His glory will fill this earth. It's filling it now if we look around the right way. But he says he can't enter the strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. And it said, he said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. So once again, he's saying, let me explain something to you. I'm about my father. I'm about all the goodness in this earth. I'm the one who's conquered evil. I'm the one who's conquered death soon to be. I'm the one who's conquered these impure spirits. I'm the one who's came in and, and tied up the strong man. So that my father can be glorified. So that I can show you a way. So I can show you why I'm here and what I'm going to do. And it was basically one of those how dare you statements saying you think I'm an impure spirit. You think I'm out of my mind. And it's because they were trying to understand in a worldly way how could these things happen. How can this be any good. He's not following all the rules about the Sabbath. And once again there was this crowd around him. And once again people were believing. A lot were following Christ. But when he talks, about the, he talks about Satan attacking Satan and that house being divided, once again, that's our own lives. We, we're not going to have the peace and comfort and joy if we're in that continual battle. I want to do what I want to do, and I want to do what's comforting to me and what brings me peace and joy and happiness. But that is so fleeting, it never lasts, so I continue to pursue more and more of things that aren't getting me anywhere. That house, that life cannot stand. But when we feed that good wolf, we say, I want what's, what, what God's will is. I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. I want to serve God's purpose. I want to block out the thoughts of others that may mean well and may mean harm. I want to say, thank you. I'm going to keep serving him. And that's what the family of Jesus was struggling with. They couldn't understand why he was doing what he was doing. Some of his behaviors weren't common back then. And some of the behaviors we should have as Christians now aren't common at times. When you put others' needs before yourself. When you say, well, they need me, I'm going. They need somebody to talk to, I'm listening. 
You know what? Whether there's two people there or 200 people there, I'm going to go serve. Whether nobody knows what I'm doing, I'm going to do it because I know it's the right thing. So we don't want to give the good Lord a bad name. We want to make sure that our behaviors and our beliefs are the same. So we need to make sure that we honor God in all that we do. That's something you can say daily. Lord, I'm going to do a lot of things today. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to go here or there. I'm going to go out in public. I'm going to stay at home. I'm going to do whatever. Let me honor you in all that I do. That's my purpose. When people see it, I hope they see you and me. And for those times where nobody sees what I'm doing, I want you to know that I'm doing it for you, Lord, that I love you. So we don't want to give them a bad name. We want to make sure that our beliefs and behaviors are the same. And daily, we need to make sure that it's God's will that is our aim. Why are we doing what we're doing? We're not doing it so everybody thinks we're nice people. We're not doing it so nobody yells at us. We're not doing it so we feel good about ourselves. We're doing it because we know what God's done for us and we want others to know by our actions. Not just our words, talk is cheap. We gotta walk the walk. So verse 31, it says, then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. I'm gonna stop there for a second. What he says next is not, They're not my mothers and brothers. Tell them to leave. I got nothing to do with them. I'm done with them. He says none of that. But he sees everything as a teaching moment. Our lives and our actions, how how we walk through our day is a teaching moment to others. We're being watched. And we're going to be judged by some. We're not going to be perfect. And we're going to be caught in the flesh at times. And we're going to say things and do things we shouldn't do. We're going to get down on ourselves and be down and so on and so forth. And somebody's going to say, how you doing? You're going to kind of be negative or be whatever. But we know we can also feed that good wolf and we can walk in his will, in his way. And the way we can line ourselves up with him is what he says next. He says in verse 33, who are my mother and my brothers? He asked to the crowd around him. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. That's how you align yourself up with Jesus. That's how you walk for him. Talking for him is easy. Most often it doesn't accomplish anything. Walking with him can be a little bit more challenging. We have to make choices every day based on our emotions, based on our surroundings, based on what others have done to us. Now we have a right to respond. We have these rights that the Pharisees said, you can't do this on the Sabbath. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't have the power. We can let others know, you know what? I don't need to have the power. I've got the power of God in me. I'm going to do God's will. So I'm going to bite my tongue at times. I'm going to say, you know what? Thanks for your input at times. I'm going to ask God, how should I respond to this? I, I said earlier, when I go out in public these last couple of months, I really think a lot of times, God, protect me. Uh, give me the opportunity to be a good, positive influence. Let me walk the walk. I can talk the talk all day until it gets kind of dicey. And then sometimes if you're not careful, your behavior is way off track. And you know who you are inside. And others know who you are inside, but you're not showing it on the outside. And Jesus wanted to make it clear Whoever does God's will is my brother. He makes a very decisive, comprehensive statement. It's not about flesh. It's not about the blood relations. If you're a believer in Christ, you're part of my family. And we know as a church family, we have so many people that we see more often than we see our own family at times. That we sometimes have more things in common with church people because of the foundation that we try to live on. Because of our daily purpose, our daily will. And that's what God wants. So I'm going to ask you, how can you walk the walk? What do you need to do to take the next step? You can't stand still and say, I'm a believer and I'm not going anywhere until I die that I'm going to heaven. That's not God's plan. That's not God's will. God wants you to continue to walk the walk in the way you behave, the way you act, certainly the way you talk at times. But there's things in his kingdom, in his realm that he wants you to continue to walk in, whether it's serving, whether it's giving, whether it's baptism, the first step you may need to walk if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, that's the step i got to take today. So if you're watching this on Facebook Live and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I want today to be the day that you can do that, where you can say, you know what, I want to begin my journey following God. I want to begin, I, I begin my journey submitting to Christ.
All those people in those crowds, wherever he went, there was basically three types. Some were just kind of curious, wanting to know what's going on. Why is everybody going to listen to this guy? Some were condemned, some of these evil spirits. Some were condemned and said, I want him to fix all my problems so then I can go out and get more. But a lot of them, and it was growing and growing and growing, and it's still growing today, were committed. And I'm here for the right reasons. I'm here to follow him. I'm here to walk with him daily. I'm here to ask him to walk with me daily. I'm here to show him, I know you're calling me, and I'm coming to you. So whatever your next step is, I hope you're willing to take it. You can text me. You can email me. You can text your email, Pastor Eric, or call the church office. Maybe you want to follow the next step in baptism. That would be a great thing. We can, we, we can set up a baptism in the future we can do. But God's will is that you walk the walk with him, not that you just talk the talk. God's will isn't that you find fault in everything others do. And certainly anything spiritual people do. Anything religious leaders do. And, and even in your own self, God doesn't want us to find fault in ourselves. God wants us to find God in ourselves and say, how can I follow you? How can I love you? How can I live for you? I'm going to have the praise team come back up. I'm going to close this in prayer. And we're, we're going to worship in praise again in, 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 in song. You have the ability to give. Even if you're not here, you can text. You can go online. You can see it on the screen. We would love. We're so thankful for a church that... We're doing well. You always need more and want more. We want to be able to serve more and give more. But we're thankful for a loving, giving church that continues to serve in the community, continues to serve here at the church, and continues to give. All of that is walking the walk. All of that is, is making sure their behavior and their beliefs match up. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that your son, although being all man and all flesh, and like Pastor Eric said, could get down on himself if that's, what, if that's who he was. But he was a son of God and he knew he wasn't serving men, although that's what he did in his ministry here on earth. But he was pointing them to a heavenly home. He was pointing them to the fact that I'm going to pay for all that you've done. You need to walk with me. Just like he called those disciples. He's calling each of us every day. And I pray that this will inspire us to say, I'm going to walk a little bit more in step with God. I'm going to let my choices and my thoughts and my words and my actions be more in line with Jesus, more in line with God's will. That's the only way we'll tr find that true peace. That's the only way we feed that good wolf in our life. That's the only way we can have love and peace and comfort and compassion for others if we walk with him. And I pray that each person here today and each person listening will understand that's their goal. That's their purpose, to walk with God and to do his will. And we know you'll lead us to the right place. We know you have, you have control over everything that's going on. And we're thankful for that and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.